Welcome everyone. My name is Bryce Wakefield. I'm um, an Asia Program Associate here at the Woodrow Wilson Centre. Um, and at the Woodrow Wilson Centre, we consider it our goal to bring scholarly excellence to bear, um, to make such excellence relevant. Um, and it's my honour to reintroduce, I've already introduced a talk by our guest today, it's my honour to reintroduce um, Lisa Lotta Odgard, who used to be a uh, fellow at the Wilson Centre. She's also an Associate Professor of Security Studies at the Institute for Strategy um, at the Royal Danish Defence College in Denmark. She's also taught at Aarhus University in Copenhagen, and she's held positions uh, as visiting scholar at Harvard, the LSE, Redmond University, and the Institute for Far Eastern Studies. She's the author of a number of publications, including um, the one you see before me now, China and Coexistence, Beijing's National Security Strategy for the 21st Century. Available soon, not yet, but soon from all good bookstores and um, also out in the lobby for the bargain price of $45. So if you haven't done so already, make sure you get a copy on your way out. Um, without further ado, I'll leave it to Lisa to uh, give her presentation. Could you please join me in welcoming her? Thank you, Bryce, and thank you for inviting me back to present my book. Um, as usual, it's been great to see everyone again. <laughs> so I've spent a little more than today here. But um, anyway, enough talk. Um, I'll go on to present the main contents of the book. Uh, the book was started uh, during my stay at Harvard where I sort of got the idea for the book and the idea for the proposal and luckily that got me into the Wilson Center and that's then where I actually wrote the manuscript that you're going to hear me talk about today. The book is titled China and Coexistence, uh, Beijing's National Security Strategy for the 21st Century. And it's an attempt basically to understand how China perceives its own interests and how they are best taken care of in the current international system. The outline is pretty simple. I'll start off by characterizing how I see the current debate on China's rise and what's missing in that debate. Uh, then I'll go on to present my main argument from the book, which is centered on the concept of coexistence, which I see as China's way of taking care of its own interests. And finally, I'll conclude by talking about the consequences for the international system of China's, stra uh, China's strategy. If we look at the debate, in my view, there are two developments that, that are in focus for the discussion. First, uh, there is a lot of talk about China's growing economic and military capabilities and how they will change the world. Secondly, there is a major focus on U.S.-China relations and how that relationship shapes uh, world order. Following from that focus, uh, the main question that's usually asked, I think, is if China will embrace the existing international order or will China present its own alternative to that order and as it grows stronger economically and militarily, how will that change world order? Another question that's asked is, Will, you know, will the great powers be able to live together in this world or order in a relatively peaceful way, or will nationalism focus on national interests win the day with this new coming power? Um, my argument will be different in that I think uh, coexistence and nationalism will go together in this new world order. 
and I'll proceed to explain uh, why I think that is so. Looking further at the debate, I think that with the focus on China's economic and military capabilities and the U.S.-China relationship, I think there are three important characteristics of our current uh, international system that's overlooked. First, I think if you look at um, the economic and military um, basis and abilities of China, it has, it's true to say that it has risen in the group of secondary powers, but it's not yet a global great power. Um, although it has had uh, impressive growth rates, as we all know, it still only ranks, it's still far behind the United States, just looking at gross figures of GDP, it's one-third. Um, there is lots of problems in the Chinese economy. It's got all the problems of a developing country times 15. Um, it's got loads of um, social issues to deal with. It's got environmental problems. The, the quality of its infrastructure, which has been built out very quickly, is debatable. Um, there is all sorts of issues with the health system that needs to be addressed. Uh, and also, as people become more aware, those people that lose out from the economic sort of uh, miracle of China, they increasingly start to complain to an extent that today you can argue that the most serious threat towards the Chinese government is the um, widespread uh, social unrest in the country that sometimes, uh, sometimes has an ethnic basis, but also often is rooted in economic and social dissatisfaction. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, issues China has yet to address before it can be assured to reach the status of global power. Militarily, China is even weaker. It cannot really exercise much power projection, and also um, it doesn't have an alliance system, uh, and that puts it uh, on, you know, a sort of huge disadvantage compared to the United States. And, of course, also the quality of its weaponry, the training of the soldiers, uh, their experience with war, all these problems also pertain to China. They haven't been in combat for a long time. So... All these factors together means that militarily China is very far <laughs> from being uh, on a par with the United States, and, and so that's probably the weakest element of China's power at the moment. Secondly, I would argue that despite China's uh, inability to perform economically and militarily as a global great power, is it's already a political global great power. And that means that China has been able to use uh, its limited abilities to position itself as a, a state that can determine the rules and principles of state conduct and also the conduct of other international actors. So China is one of the determining states when it comes to the rules of the game. Uh, what are, what are interna international actors allowed to do and what are they not allowed to do. Um, so it kind of defines the alternative choices of actions that are open to other states. So in other words, China has been really good at exercising political diplomatic influence and in that sense it, I think it punches above its weight at the moment. Thirdly, I think the role of secondary and small powers is overlooked. Um, compared to the Cold War, um, I think they are much better positioned to, uh, to look after their national interests. And the reason for that is that currently we have, in practice, two political great powers with two alternative um, suggestions for a world order that vie for the attention of these secondary and small powers. And when that's so, um, they don't really have to align with any of the sides, so a lot of them will 
alternate between uh, siding with the U.S. and with China, depending on uh, the issue area, and that uh, increases their abilities to um, to promote their interests. I will now switch to characterize coexistence and how I understand it, how I think China understands it, and how it's pursued by China. Coexistence is basically uh, concerned with the preservation of peace and stability. And that's done by establishing common habits and practices that are designed to regulate international conduct. That's the nice definition on the slide. What it means is if you compare it to the U.S. Uh, aspirations for world order, is which are more, much more integrationist and are basically founded in liberal economic and political values, which means that at the end of the day, the U.S. will always pursue uh, a common value basis in the system, which involves much more extensive cooperation. The Chinese effort is more limited. China really only looks for ability to coexist in a peaceful way with other great powers and to keep a lid or solve conflicts that threaten to end up in a um, violent conflict between the great powers. So coexistence is much more about the right to be left alone, to pursue your own interests, rather than looking for uh, extensive cooperation with other states. It's not the only country to have used this strategy. Uh, it's a typical strategy of influence for powers that do not quite have the material economic military capabilities to claim great power status, and therefore they seek to exercise political influence that can make up for that uh, insufficient resource base. <coughs> other, other states that have had a concept of coexistence, the most prominent ones would be the Soviet Union and India. And if we try to compare it briefly to their uh, understanding of what coexistence was, then the Soviet concept, it was also about coexisting with, with another power, but for the Soviet Union, it was always uh, in conflict with their uh, goal to have a world revolution. And because that sort of dynamic existed, that on the one hand, the Soviet Union recognized that it couldn't quite overtake the, U the world by violent means in the intermediate, and so had to find a more peaceful way of coexistence with the U.S., it maintained this world of fundamental revolution in the system. And so it was never quite convincing uh, and never really took root because the U.S. was never convinced that the Soviet Union was uh, genuinely serious about this coexistence concept. India is another state that has, that has for at least for some time in, it, uh, in its history, had a coexistence concept. It saw it as a more permanent state. Uh, India was a non-aligned country that would try to ameliorate the effects of the U.S. pursuit of world order uh, and its search for a more integrated and extensively co cooperative system. Uh, and it vied for the attention of the developing world in doing this. But also, India never really managed to convince other countries that this was a sincere attempt because, of course, India quickly became bogged down in uh, the uh, balance of power dynamics in its neighborhood with Pakistan, with China, and other things. And it sort of quickly had to resort to traditional balancing policies at the same time as it claimed to pursue coexistence. Uh, so that was never something that took off really either. Compared to these, uh, 
China also has a temporary view of what coexistence is. So it's a strategy towards something else, essentially. And the ultimate goal for China is to maintain the unity of what China defines as China Chinese territory and its people and to preserve the uh, power of the Communist Party. It's moderate in its uh, expectations of coordination, so it doesn't go as far as the Indians uh, in its expectations of what can be done. Uh, but in contrast to the others, it sees this concept as an alternative to other types of world order that have been presented by the United States and the Soviet Union. In pursuing this order of coexistence, China has in part, without meaning to, China has become a maker rather than a taker of international order. This has happened not because China sees it as an aggressive strategy to, um, to obtain global great power status, but instead it has been a strategy to avoid China's descent uh, into secondary power status. So it has pursued this uh, position because it has felt threatened by some of the policies that has been pursued by the Western world and has felt a need to go against them. Also, China has pursued this strategy because uh, the Chinese government sees it as uh, urgent and important to direct the majority of its resources towards domestic socioeconomic development to ensure a more stable economic uh, and military future for the country. So what is actually the sort of more practical contents of this concept? It's not really a sort of fancy version of coexistence that the Chinese put out. Uh, it's written into their constitution, so you can read it there. It's also an efficient policy, but it's also a policy practice that plays out in different fora. And much of the line of thinking is the same as what you find in the old UN system. So what China is, lo is looking for is to preserve the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of other states. Uh, it does so because it... it feels it has to uh, go against the attempts from the Western world to say that civil and political rights are as important as non-interference and absolute sovereignty if there is an attempt to undermine these, uh, these rights in a way that ends up in genocide or other serious problems and that ju then justifies military intervention. China then has taken the other side in saying, well, we cannot accept that. We have to leave it to the governments to decide when intervention in is justified. And of course, they're worried that they themselves could be subject to interference down the line. Also, China pursues mutual non-aggression. And that's not just a label. That's to be taken seriously because since China is rather weak, especially militarily, it actually takes great pains to avoid a military confrontation in general. And it's serious when it says it's not interested in ending up in a, in a military conflict or solving conflicts by the use of force simply because it can't really afford it. Thirdly, China puts a premium on the legal equality of states and mutu mutual benefit, and what that means is that instead of prioritizing individuals, it's the rights of states that should be prioritized. They are sort of the holders of moral authority. So uh, rather than, again, rather than supporting the rights of individuals, it says, well, we need to look at the states first 
social economic welfare needs to be go through the governments rather than through uh, businesses uh, at the sub-governmental level. Um, and that may not be a perfect system, but it's the best system we can have and the most fair system we can have. So it's not that China says that it doesn't care about human beings. In fact, it takes pain to stress that it does care about human lives. But it will stick to those that argue that in order to take care of individuals, we have to look to the states first before we look to the individual. And finally, uh, the concept uh, is based on mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. How does that play out in practice? Well, at the moment after the Cold War, China has been looking to <coughs> position itself as a kind of mediator uh, when there are conflicts. So instead of uh, positioning itself as an opponent of the United States, of the United States, it has tried to present itself as the states that look that's looking for compromises, especially on issue areas where the use of force with the United States could be a possibility. Secondly, uh, China has also uh, made clear that with regard to peacemaking operations, China requires governmental consent unless the UN system has proved that there are threats to international peace and security. Um, in pursuing this, uh, China has been quite good at sticking to its principles. So if a state clearly has broken the rules and had admitted to do so, such as North Korea, China will vote for UN resolutions that it doesn't like. Uh, just to make sure or to make clear that it pursues the principles that it has said it would. A third means of putting this concept into practice <coughs> is to s show solidarity with governments. Naturally, that's to, to make sure that the states remain the fundamental unit. And also, uh, China increasingly emphasizes the role of regional and functional organizations in managing regional security issues that reach the agenda of the UN Security Council and also in determining when there is a threat to international security, uh, international peace and stability that requires intervention. This is not something that was uh, implemented from the start but it developed as China was looking for support for its program from for international order from secondary and small powers in the developing world. And it has grown to become increasingly important in Chinese policies. And fourthly, it's, it continues to, stre to stress that absolute sovereignty main should maintain a fundamental status in international law. So what China pursues is what, it's call, what it calls political pluralism in the international system. So rather than fighting or allowing people to intervene to create, uh, to undertake nation building, democracy building, these things, it stresses that uh, political pluralism should be the order of the day. And in doing so, China has managed to obtain quite a lot of support uh, from the developing parts of the world, uh, not in the sense that they completely side with China on all issues, as I've said, but in many cases, China is able to attract a following uh, from major regional and minor regional powers that wants an alternative to the United States. How well does this policy then work for China? If we look at border disputes, which is a sort of very sensitive topic for most states, uh, in one way, this primary theme of coexistence has 
played out quite well in that China has sought compromise in its border disputes, uh, of which it had um, many after the Cold War. Um, it hasn't tried in general to take advantage of the situation of weaker states on its borders to try and you know, get a better deal than they would have. In general, it has sort of held back on these issues and demonstrated willingness to show compromise in the interest of stability. And also it has demonstrated that it, it's willing to pursue uh, its national interest by peaceful means rather than sort of aggressi aggressively uh, employing uh, means of force. However, at the same time, there is a secondary theme of nationalism that emerges from time to time uh, and that puts a question mark behind China's sincerity about this policy of coexistence. We have seen it in the border dispute with India and especially on the issue of Tibet. We've seen it in the South China Sea, uh, East China Sea. There is an element of coercion uh, and national identity that sort of crops up sometimes or emerges and blurs this picture of peaceful pursuit of interest a little bit. Uh, and it's rooted in China's historical definition of borders, which breaks with the general consensus that it is, that it is effective control of territory and peoples that determine whether you have the right to territory. China has a different interpretation of international law and it seems unwilling to back down on this even though it goes against its, its sort of interest to appear to be peaceful, stability looking and compromising. So there is a secondary theme it doesn't take over, and the reason, or it doesn't take over the primary theme of coexistence. And one reason for that is that coexistence continues to be seen as the best and most acceptable tool for China to maintain national unity. And so long as that's the case, this coexistence policy will remain the primary theme. Another area I've looked at is the UN Security Council. And again, you can see the sort of same issues play out. Coexistence is the primary theme, and it's probably here it's at its strongest. And that's of course, well not of course, but it is because I think that the UN Security Council issues, they're sort of often further removed from uh, issues that touch at the immediate security of uh, the Communist Party rule and core national security I issues for China. So here, this nationalist theme is less pronounced than uh, it will be in border issues. Anyway, if you look at the UN Security Council, what we can see is that China has been again quite good at looking for compromises with secondary powers. It's been good at l uh, listening to entities such as the African Union, the views of ASEAN, other regional powers, uh, the Islamic Conference, and follow their views to some extent. Uh, it has also been very good in, pers in pursuing an order and hooking its own understanding of coexistence up on a revised version of the UN system, which includes this larger role for regional and functional organizations. And in doing so, I think in this forum, China has been successful in presenting itself as a power that is much more morally consistent than the United States. And the reason for that is that China has been good at saying the principles it intends to follow in its policy, and it's been good at carrying through on that. 
so it has been much better at saying, well, f we believe so-and-so is right, and actually putting that into practice, either by voting for resolutions it doesn't like, and then in the remarks it will say, well, we don't really approve of sanctions, but I guess we'd have to recognize that North Korea did break uh, international peace and security, so we'll accept this or vote for the uh, Libya resolution that gave NATO a mandate to intervene. So on various occasions, they have uh, tried to demonstrate that they mean what they say. And so even you can then argue with them that their principles are wrong, but they've been better at sticking to them, I think, than the Western world has. The secondary theme, though, pop, pops up again from time to time, and the main problem here is that China advocates political pluralism in the international system, but of course this is an empty shell because China has no model for state-to-society relations to put into it. So if we compare it to the United States, the United States and Europe, subscribes to an economic, uh, political, liberal model, and that is a standard by which the U.S. performance is measured. That means that everyone knows what the U.S. is about, basically. It may not live up to this standard, but we know how to measure the U.S. performance, so we kind of know what kind of great power the United States is. When we look at China, China has no similar standard which, it, which we can measure China by. Um, China has moved away from communism and it's trying to create a Sino-based alternative which is not quite translates into a workable model for state-society relations that can be seen as an alternative to democracy. There is no procedure really for how to implement it beyond a few sort of very sort of modest principles. And that's not convincing to other states. So one of China's problems is that when they look at China, they can't really see what kind of great power they'll get should China make it to global political great power status. And that makes most other countries uncomfortable. Uh, what they see is this nationalist theme playing out, but that's not a nice alternative. So this, again, there is this secondary theme of nationalism that makes China uh, questionable uh, seen as a great power seen from the point of view of other countries. A third issue I've looked at is the challenges to, um, to China's uh, pursuit uh, of coexistence. So I've tried to pick a hard case for China. And these, I would say, are issues such as Taiwan, their domestic use of force against ethnic minorities, and the role of Japan uh, in the region and in the world. But even here, you can find this theme of coexistence is tends to be a primary theme in that China has actually been fairly pragmatic towards uh, Taiwan, it's pursued growing social and economic integration rather than insisting in practice on, uh, you know, invasion or taking political integration further quickly. Uh, it has entered into political dialogue, and this is also the case with the minorities in China. However, here, um, this effort is often crowded out because these issues are seen as a core national security issue. And so the PLA and the People's Armed Police often comes to dominate uh, the situation or the sort of line of command. And because horizontal coordination in the Chinese political system is very weak, uh, the more long-term social and economic reforms never managed to take root and to be transmitted to the local levels of government. So again, even in these hard cases, there is uh, this 
theme of coexistence. Um, but it is, again, a question mark is put by it because, again, this nationalist theme pops up, which makes China consistently insist on sovereignty over Taiwan to resort to the use of force to preserve national unity and to portray Japan as an illegitimate great power. So the conclusion to all this, I would say, is that coexistence, although it is disturbed by this nationalist theme, remains seen as the best strategy to protect China's principal objective of national unity. And so long as that's the case, the secondary theme of nationalism will remain sort of more under the radar in Chinese policies. What kind of world order does that result it in? Well, it results in a system where you have two different world orders that can't very well be united because their fundamental, the fundamental aspiration in them are not the same. This integrationist extensive cooperation value-based pursuit that the U.S. and Europe uh, pursues and will continue to pursue uh, because it's ingrained in structures such as the alliance system and other things will maintain or will be maintained alongside the Chinese concept of coexistence. So what you get is a kind of absence of a coherent unitary global order. Uh, it's difficult to establish frameworks of conflict management and conflict resolution that is permanent, so you tend to have ad hoc frameworks of conflict management. Uh, policy coordination will be more down to trial and error because um, there is not really, again, permanent mechanisms to resort to. And what you also will have is relatively influential secondary and small powers that will avo avoid aligning very closely to one side. Um, so this is not necessarily a particularly bad system. It's not necessarily prone to war or anything like that, but it is a more f it's a flex it's a system that requires a high degree of flexibility and ability to adjust to the to changing circumstances, I guess, uh, because the rate of insecurity in the system is relatively high. On the other hand, um, compared to the Cold War and its sort of very hostile, ide ideological, ideologically based, value-based competition, this appears to be a f more friendly uh, system in a way, both to the U.S. and to China. So I think this is the system that we're actually ha going to have for the 21st century, or for at least for the foreseeable future. Um, so I think this, the system we operate in, the main feature of features of that is already in place. That was what I would like to say about the book. Great. And, uh, thank, thank you very you. much, Lisa, if you'll join me in giving her a hand. Okay, the usual rules for questions apply. Um, just raise your hand. Joshua has got the microphone. He'll come around and give it to you uh, if I select you. Please state your name and any um, current affiliation you might have. Go. Uh, Gil Rosman, Princeton University. I wonder if if your talk doesn't depend too much on a dichotomy between coexistence and nationalism, whereas so much of China's rhetoric is how to link the two. And a number of places in your talk, you, you made it seem as if nationalism or national identity just blurs the line, mm -hmm. or uh, there's no evolution in this system. It's an enduring system. It's not evolving. 
and we have coexistence dominating and what happened in 2009, 2010, and what Chinese have been writing in recent years is just something that obfuscates the overall trend which you discern and you identify China's goals as if you're pretty clear about what they are and they're relatively limited rather than including some of the identity themes, a kind of Sinocentric regional approach. And when you refer to the votes against resolutions that criticize North Korea, you act as if China is consistent in this rather than suggesting that China has shifted since 2009 not to vote on the whole against North Korea. And now, even if North Korea uses force, it won't do that. So that would seem to me to defy your overall generalization. I could go on for a while to talk about some of the themes you raised, but it just seems to me there's a, there's a problem with this, you know, this clear dichotomy that isn't qualified. Um, well, <laughs> I think you're right in pointing out that China is not consistent in everything it does, and like all other powers, it does break its own principles from time to time. So, you know, you can always find examples of inconsistency. But um, to my mind, uh, I think China has been fairly good at pursuing this theme of coexistence and nationalism together. It's not an unproblematic marriage um, because the nationalist goals, in a way, goes against China's overall pursuit. Um, and that's why I present them as sort of, you know, that it blurs the picture. But I don't mean to say that, that China would, uh, would depart or you know, China is genuine in this understanding of national identity. I think it, it will not back down on its claim to Taiwan. It will not back down on its, its claim to South China Sea. That has been a consistent theme for China for decades. Uh, but it has sought to find a policy that can accommodate these goals and at the same time avoid great power conflict, if you like, and can allow it to pursue its policies internally. And I think it's, it's gone quite a long way to do that. For example, if you look at the South China Sea, it hasn't really set itself goals that it couldn't more or less um, implement. So it has agreed to shelve its sovereignty claim, for example, and it has agreed to cooperate or try to at least negotiate with the others to some extent, cooperate, uh, exchange uh, limited information. Uh, it has, you know, in many cases held back when other states were pro provocative because China is not the only provocative state in this area. Um, it has done a number of things to reconcile uh, the other countries. At the same time, it has then maintained that, you know, it's not going to change its fundamental goal in the region, but it may not necessarily mean that it will occupy the whole area or anything like that, and that's also unrealistic. So. I guess Chi in, if you look at it from the Chinese point of view, you could argue that they are happily uh, willing to allow other states to operate in the area in practice, but what they're seeking is a recognition that the, the area is, is basically theirs. Um, and that coexistence policy is kind of meant as the glue that will s allow them to maintain this goal. So I wouldn't say that they're opposed to each other. I would say that they go together. Um, I do think China has also s sinocentric elements in its national policies, in its pursuit of a Chinese model for state society relations, but I don't think it's developed to an extent that it can really sell it abroad. And so 
lacking a sort of alternative to the liberal model, what it can do is have this coexistence model that tells you a lot about international relations but very little about what uh, a state should be should look like internally and I guess another problem or not a problem but another reason for this is that national identity is sort of seen as a fairly stable factor and that interests are tied in with national identity and therefore you can't imagine a world where common interests play a larger role. So there's a lot more to this coexistence nationalist theme than I said. I don't know if it answers your question, but anyway. I have a question. Um, just to push you a little bit on that, um, uh, on what you just said, I mean, is there any notion, therefore, that this coexistence model that the Chinese supposedly adhere to is a kind of stopgap until China does develop the abilities to implement what it sees as a China model or a Sinocentric model? Mm, well, <laughs> as long as it doesn't have that model fully developed, I think China is not really able to answer itself what kind of a great power it will be and what it will use its power for. Uh, I think, in a sense, that's also why China has been good at being pragmatic and, you know, compromising uh, in the international system because it's not able to say itself what kind of a great power it will be beyond these national goals, which are very inward-looking and very China-focused and doesn't really give guidance to the rest of the world. But, of course, especially... That was probably always the case, but especially today, you can't really be a global great power without having an agenda for the rest of the world that tells them uh, what state-society relations should look like and have a standard for that. St other states want to know what this great power is about, what kind of values will it pursue and what effect will it have on them. And if all the sort of end goals or end state are defined as nationalist, well, that points to a state that's in transition as regards its domestic structures, I would say, because it doesn't translate into any model that's sellable for to other countries. So I don't think, <laughs> I think the problem is more China doesn't know where it will end up and so it cannot even answer that question itself. Okay, good. Uh, Helen. I'm Helen Rochelle um, with the Resources for the Future. I wonder if you can tell us anything about the significance of its apparent program now for great sea power and air power military buildup. Uh, if it just wants to live as a nation uh, with internal focus and economic development, why or is it true that it now expects to be a big military power internationally? Well, as most rising powers would do, China also develops it m its military power. Um, to some extent, you can argue that that's a natural process as it's economy continues to grow, China would also put money after military development. Um, and I think part of the reason is that China does uh, feel uh, that the U.S. is trying to, uh, to contain, a, sorry? Yeah, to encircle China. Uh, militarily, and since the U.S. is, you know, much stronger than China in that sense, not least because of the alliance system, I guess there is some truth to that. I mean, <laughs> China is probably at its weakest in its own neighborhood, and that's not a good position to be in. So I do think that is one reason for China to develop its military power. I also think that 
when looking at, you're right that Chinese air and Navy power uh, can be used to be increasingly assertive in its near abroad, and to some extent that's also China's goal. But I do think that the majority of China's resources, also for the military, they actually go towards combating social unrest. And the, the main challenge for China, you know, is to that it has to resort to the use of force against its own citizens. And much of the efforts of the PLA, the People's Armed Police, a lot of their resources, they go towards domestic uh, problems. That's not ideal, and it's not ideal seen from a Chinese point of view either, I believe. But I think, you know, in our concern for China's military buildup, I think it's important to stress that that, <laughs> that means that a lot of resources, again, are tied up uh, within China, so they cannot afford to use this military power for much else than access denial and that type of thing. I don't believe they will anyway. Hi, how are you? I'm um, Randall Doyle. I'm from the Lao Gai Research Foundation. I'd like to ask you a question maybe dealing with the Chinese leadership. Last year, it was noted in the Financial Times that for the first time in like 20 years, China spent more money on internal security than it did in its military budget. Mm -hmm. Yet, all the time we read about this, this kind of uh, ideological or maybe philosophical battle going on within the higher ranks of its leadership of how they should uh, approach uh, international, uh, their international role, their status. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about this kind of conflict that's going on in the uh, in the upper ranks uh, of the leadership. Because on one hand, quite often their military leadership, as you well know, will make these provocative statements like they would see the, like to see the United States Navy push back to Hawaii, you know, that type of thing. Mm. On the other hand, Joseph Nye uh, mentioned when I asked him a question one time, Joseph Nye told me that, well, as you mentioned earlier, it's one thing to say this is what you would like to do. Mm. But it's another thing what you can do. But obviously with the South China Sea situation, uh, that became a little bit serious, and the Chinese backed off. So there does seem to be an element in its government that they like to create, if anything, kind of a buffer zone along the East Coast there due to history in the 19th century and so forth, which they're very well aware of and most people here are aware of. So could you kind of touch on that, how this kind of battle is going on where basically on one hand – Leadership is praying that they don't have internal up you know, rebellions and so forth. On the other hand, they're scared to death of the outside world in the sense of, of, of representing a threat to them again like they were 100 years ago. Well, I think compared to maybe 15 years ago or 10 years ago, I think China has become better at engaging with the world rather than, you know, see threats everywhere. Um, and that is one reason for China's, you know, strengthened position and its increase, increased influence, I think. Uh, so I don't think it's that China sees threats everywhere. Um, <coughs> I think China is, <laughs> you know, I think it's, a, it's realistic in, in thinking that the U.S. doesn't want China to be a global great power on a par with the U.S. if the U.S. can avoid it and the U.S. is going to use the means it best can to avoid that. And to some extent, it is encirclement, but another means is to use China's own methods. So the U.S. has become much more engaged in multilateralism, drawing the secondary powers over to it and all this. Uh, in saying that, I think you're right in pointing out that there is a sort of tension within China as to you know how to deal with the international system and the demands of that, while the internal problems of unrest and dissatisfaction, corruption, all these things grow. And that is another problem with China's current position because it has taken the opportunity to fill the vacuum after, of, after the Soviet Union and it has taken that opportunity quite well or used it quite well to gain inordinate influence. But I think what China hadn't really foreseen is the number of demands that, are, that it is then met with when taking up this role in the international system. So what China probably initially 
primarily saw as a sort of reaction to U.S. policies that it was worried would have negative side effects on China, ended up requiring that China became a lot more proactive in areas that it hadn't foreseen, and that costs a lot of resources. For example, in Africa, I think <laughs> in many ways China originally, after the Cold War, its engagement was probably driven by, you know, energy, it wanted resources, out again, found it easy because, you know, the demands of the West were unpopular and all this. But quickly China realized that today you can't really have a presence like it has without facing political, socioeconomic demands that it hadn't dis expected. So it had to develop an agenda that it hadn't really planned for with regard to governance and the treatment of labor and all these things, or at least try to do it. And I think that's the, the dilemma for the leadership because at the end of the day, they need the current influence and they benefit from the influence they have in the system. But on the other hand, the domestic problems have not, you know, become less. I think they have become much worse. And because some of the reason or some of the problems are ingrained in the political structures of China, they can't really just change how they do things. And so at the end of the day, their priority, the regime's priority, will be the core threats to, to the regime. And that, I believe, is seen as social unrest and the domestic problems. So they will try to prioritize that and therefore lie relatively low. And as you say, they have tried to be a little bit more assertive, but I, they back down because I don't think they can afford it. They have to focus on these issues before they can do other things. Okay, the gentleman in the brown tie. Over here. <coughs> Hello, I'm Ben Lawson from Army Intelligence. I'd just like to ask um, where you see the direction of internationalism and international organizations going. Do you see them sort of, it sounds like you see them sort of maintaining a level because of the difficulties in moving forward and not you know, getting greater and maybe not getting less either. And just to add on to that, I'd like to ask about how you see the currents of Chinese internationalism playing into that and perhaps working with currents of U.S. flexibility, because certainly after the World War II, the U.S. was probably at its strength, and with a certain amount of flexibility, it's still very strong, but it, it's not demanding that everybody toe the line anymore. So I wonder if you see those currents of U.S. flexibility and Chinese internationalism sort of playing together to make it possible for internationalism to be on the upswing. Um, I hope I understood your question correctly, but at least I think the international organizations will continue to be relevant, but maybe in a slightly different way, because I think not least through the policies of China, the regional organizations have gained much more prominence. Uh, China has helped push for the regional organizations to play a greater role in, in regional security issues which is mainly what I've looked at. Probably it's the case with other issues as well. So I think it will be a s fairly stable presence. I also think the United States, there was a period until five years ago or so where the U.S. probably neglected its uh, multilateral her heritage and um, sort of le let the Chinese take over. And one feature that the Chinese are good at and that we see lately in the Arctic, actually, is that they walk in where the U.S. is out or is neglecting. So, you know, the Chinese took over in a way. They saw the benefits of multilateral organizations and in a way took over U.S. policy and twisted it to their own needs. Um, I don't think nationalism will form a particularly, you know, Chinese nationalism can't really very well 
be played out in these organizations to any great extent because, you know, by nature, there are multinational efforts and compromise efforts. So this is where China will use its coexistence policy. I don't see it as able to use it for nationalist purposes, if I that's what you mean. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, th I think <laughs> it plays together with this coexistence policy, and so it will remain a strong feature because, as I said, I don't think that will die. I think it remains, for China, it remains a sort of means to reach its long-term ends, and as long as that's, that's the <coughs> case and they've got more pressing problems, it will maintain that that policy. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Michael Yehuda from George Washington University. Um, as I was listening to you, uh, I was wondering how far the issue of coexistence is really uh, something that belongs to the Communist Party rather than to something called China. Um, the nationalism of, um, of China uh, that is portrayed today uh, can be traced back to Sun Yat-sen and the, the early part of the 20th century. And um, in that sense, it's not necessarily um, uh, sort of in integral to the Communist Party itself, although they did play a large part in the Communist victory. And um, in that sense, say, if you take Japan, uh, Mao's attitude towards Japan was very different from that which emerged after Deng Xiaoping took over. So it, it, it is variable. But coexistence, I think, is, is crucial, or is seen as crucial, to preserving Communist Party rule. And that is, that, is, that is the key. And when Chinese leaders talk about core interests, it's always that that comes first. And in that sense, uh, I don't see how that can be a basis for uh, introducing something new to world order. Uh, you said at the beginning that China was a maker rather than a taker. I find that difficult to see. I, despite the sense of... Um, opposition to the United States that has been a sub-theme of your presentation, I can think of no country that has benefited more from the United States and its policies in the last 30 years than China. It was the United States which ushered China into the World Bank and to IMF and to all the major international economic organizations that played such a big part in uh, the facilitating the emergence of China. Similarly, it was the United States ally Japan which got the infrastructure going to start with. Since then, um, the, uh, the United States, which has <coughs> been the main promoter of globalization for, for some time, uh, has helped enormously to promote China, uh, domestically and externally, and the United States has not sought, as far as I understand it, to stop the stop Chinese uh, deepening their interest in Africa or indeed in Latin America. <coughs> and so um, this idea of the United States as <coughs> the protagonist against China seems to me uh, a rather mo much more complicated than, than, than <coughs> it is. And um, in that sense, part of the trouble for the Communist Party is that uh, many of the international norms really uh, go against uh, the preservation of Communist Party rule. This would apply to the rules of the World Trade Organization, which, uh, in which China has not followed up on the obligations it undertook when it first entered. And I, I, I could go on in many ways, but I, I, I don't, I'd like to know in what ways you see China as a maker of the rules of, of international order? That's a very valid question. Um, uh, to take your first question about it, 
whether coexistence is tied to Communist Party rule uh, and does not you know, have the roots in China that nationalism has. In a way, you can say that's true, but what is the Communist Party? Because the Communist Party is in transition. I mean, it, it's no longer the Communist Party that it was once, and I guess even if you have an authoritarian state, it is it does consist of a lot of factions, and some or a lot of uh, the Communist Party's effort is going towards creating a, a, a kind of alternative based on more Chinese values, sometimes combined with with you know, it's what it calls its own concept of democracy and things like that. But it is putting a lot of money and effort towards creating an alternative state society model that it can use. Um, so while it may be tied in with the Communist Party, so long as the Communist Party looks, you know, set to survive and represent China and is able to renew itself, you know, I can't, at least I cannot look beyond that. Um, you know, and I would say the Communist Party itself is a huge, you know, organization and political structure that you cannot just, you know, define in few words or say it hasn't changed over history in its setup. So, and that doesn't mean, and it's, and in a sense, the structures of the Communist Party is, has become an ingrained or inherent part to some extent also of Chinese national identity. I don't think you can have a structure like that without it having an impact on the national identity of the country. So, you know, they're not necessarily s totally separate. Um, is China a maker? That's a good question. Um, and I can fully understand why that question would be raised. You know, I don't think China, as I said, has created a fancy new model uh, that is super original or innovative. As I said, much of it, a lot of it is old lines of thinking, and they have also been present in Chinese history for a long time. The way it implements it is quite different because it already had coexistence, as I said, during the Cold War, but at the time it mainly, it remained a, a rhetorical device mainly because China was only a secondary power and it could really only use it to promote its national interests by carving out a position uh, in between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but that's not the case anymore. So partly because it felt a need to, partly because it was met by unforeseen demand, demands, China has upheld some principles, like I said, from the old UN system, and also in the process started to create new principles. Um, and they're not necessarily fancy, but if they hadn't been there, I'm quite sure we would have had a different set of principles that ruled the world, if you like, with the civil and political rights being much more fundamental. And China has been, you know, and also the role of regional organizations being less. So I think China has been a maker of international order in the sense that it has upheld some principles that would otherwise have been weakened and new principles have emerged, not because China has been innovative, but because in the n its need to compromise with other powers, which it has had to because of its relative weakness, other principles have emerged that are now uh, more and more manifesting themselves, and indeed the West is sort of starting to use it themselves. Um, for their purposes, I guess. So that's what I mean by maker. So I don't know if that satisfies you, but...
Um, thank you very much. I'm Ray Den from Georgetown University. Uh, I just want to know you about your opinions about the uh, uh, structural conflicts of China's rise to the international order. Um, I've, al I've always think that um, the peaceful coexistence policy of China is kind of wishful thinking because, I mean, who wouldn't want to rise and grow in a peaceful environment? But the current uh, dominant powers and other rising powers wouldn't let China to do so. So we see the um, like encirclement around China and also the TPP come in, will come into play. So even if you argue that the cake is getting bigger, but China's share is rising. So I just want to know about the, your opinion about that. Well, I think, yeah, it's a difficult pursuit. But as I said, it is the most realistic route uh, to pursue influence if you can't afford, you know, military conflict, really. And I think China has been fairly successful in its effort. And because, you know, I, I gave the example of the border conflicts, and although that's in a way a bad case for me to choose, uh, because it has these nationalist goals alongside its coexistence policy. It has been relatively good, I think, in fact, impressively good at solving all these border issues from the Cold War, you know, in a relatively peaceful, compromising, sort of stand back fashion. I don't think the United States or other powers are at the moment are. I mean, ch the U.S. is trying to encircle China, but they're not looking for a war <laughs> with China by any means. Um, so that's not what I meant to say. And insofar as the U.S. is convinced that China is sincere in its pursuit of non-aggression, I guess uh, the likelihood of a conflict between the two that involves the use of force looks, you know, is pretty slim, the likelihood of that, and that will allow China to continue to pursue this policy. Um, so I don't see this system as particularly prone to conflict. I think the U.S. and most other powers recognize that China can't really afford a war and that means that, you know, when China becomes a little bit too provocative in the South China Sea, if you act a little bit more assertively, push, push back a little harder instead of just ignoring the problem, China has proved quickly to, to retreat because it has to. So I think it's a, you know, it's a realistic pattern uh, that will be pursued for the foreseeable future. And also you can say both the U.S. and China benefit from the current economic uh, system. They're not the same type of market economies, and China has not fully embraced uh, market economy in the sense that the U.S. has, or at least its understanding of what market economy it entails is different. It defines it differently. Um, but even so... You know, it's a, it's an uncontested feature that the fundamentals of market economic structures in the international system can benefit both. So, you know, there are lots of reasons why, uh, why this policy would be allowed to continue. I think. Very good. Okay, we're 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 wrapping up now. So, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Lisa for her stimulating conversation.